In this video, we want to find the Fourier series that represents the triangular wave function given by the following formula. f of x equals the absolute value of x over pi when x is between negative pi and pi. And then we also define it to be 2 pi periodic. So as you shift down 2 pi units, this will just repeat what you saw before. So the graph of f you can see illustrated right here uh, that from from negative pi to pi, this is basically just the absolute value function. Um, I did scale it down so that um, when you hit pi right here, this is actually equal to the y coordinate of one. Um, that's not necessary, but that does that'll make the Fourier series just a little bit cleaner. Uh, but it doesn't it doesn't make much of a difference because after all, um, changing the function by a constant multiple only changes the Fourier series by a constant multiple as well. Uh, so again, this is mostly just for convenience, but not a necessary step here. Uh, what happens, and we've talked about this previously in this lecture, that if you take just any function whatsoever, any continuous function, like the absolute value function, you can just carbon copy it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it, and you can make it a periodic function. And that periodic function will have a Fourier series representation that perfectly matches it. You'll notice with this function, there are, because of its symmetry with respect to the y-axis, um, since the original function was even, there are no jump discontinuities. This function is continuous. Now, sure, its derivative is undefined at the jumps, but its derivative is piecewise continuous. And so by the Fourier convergence theorem, um, this Fourier series that we're about to compute will be exactly equal to uh, the triangular wave function, sometimes called the sawtooth function, uh, because it looks like the teeth of a saw, like here. And we created a sawtooth function, which is two pi periodic. It ranges from negative pi to pi. Uh, but I want you to be aware that you could make this work with any period whatsoever. If your function was 2L periodic, be aware that you could find the Fourier coefficients by similar formulas to what we saw before. So for a 2 pi periodic function, the constant in our Fourier series, so just as a reminder, we're looking for the Fourier's representation, f of x here, is equal to a sub 0 plus the sum where n ranges from one to infinity, uh, we're gonna get a n cosine of nx plus b n sine of nx, like so. So this is the Fourier series that we're looking for. And so we had formulas previously how to find the coefficients a zero, a n, b n. And we did those for two pi periodic functions, but be aware if you shift it to any period, like a two L period, the calculations we did before would modify perfectly. So instead of getting one over two pi, so the standard formula is one over two pi times the integral from negative pi to pi. Um, instead, what we get is the integral from one over two L so the, the bottom number is the length of the period. You then integrate from negative L to L f of x dx. Um, that's how you get the constant coefficient. In order to grab a sub n, the coefficients of the cosines, normally the formula is 1 over pi times the integral from negative pi to pi of f of x cosine of nx. If you change the period, you're going to get 1 over L, so half of the period, integral from negative L to L, that makes sense, F of X times cosine of, and this is the part that changes the most, you're gonna get pi NX over L DX, like so, because you have to change the cosine so it also is 2L periodic, the pi over L will do exactly that. It changes the period appropriately. And if you want to do it for sine as well, um, the standard formula is one over pi, integral from negative pi to pi, f of x sine of nx. But if you change the period, you're gonna get one over L, that makes sense. Integrate from negative L to L, f of x, which is already 2L periodic, times sine of, you have to make sine become 2L periodic, so you're gonna insert this pi over L, and then you get the nx like usual. And so I want you to be aware that these formulas, these general Fourier coefficient formulas, can be used to find the Fourier representation of any function that is periodic, whether it's 2 pi periodic or not. Now, in our example here, we are 2 pi periodic. Uh, and remember our function, it looks like our function is f of x equals the absolute value of x over pi, um, and it, it is 2 pi periodic. So we'll use the simplified formulas in this example here. So as we try to compute um, let's keep the formula on the screen here. So as we try to compute the constant term, we have to take one over two pi integral from negative pi to pi of f of x here, um, for which 
we do exactly that. We're going to get 1 over 2 pi. Now, since our function is the absolute value of x over pi, there's another pi, so I'm just going to bring that out already. So 1 over 2 times pi squared. So we have to integrate... Um, we have to integrate the absolute value of x. Now, the antiderivative of absolute value of x is a little bit more complicated than I want to deal with right now, but by symmetry, um, the absolute value function, right, it's a symmetric function with respect to the y-axis. So if I just integrate from zero to pi of the absolute value of x, I can double that. Um, doubling that will cancel out this two, as we insert a two in there now. Um, that puts the bottom down to zero, but it also has the convenience that if you're only looking at zero to pi, the absolute value of x is identical to x, and that's a function that's much easier to integrate here. So by using symmetry, this becomes one over pi squared times the integral from zero to pi of f of x dx there. The antiderivative of x by the power rule, the usual power rule is x squared over two. Um, we're gonna integrate from zero to pi. If you plug in zero, you're gonna get back zero. If you plug in pi, you end up with a pi squared. Um, and so you end up with pi squared over two pi squared. The pi squareds cancel out, we end up with one half. And this is exactly the reason why we had a divided by pi in the original function. That was just to clean this thing up so that I made this coefficient be a one half instead of a, uh, instead of a one over two pi or something like that. So in particular, the constant term um, for your Fourier coefficients here is going to be one half. Uh, now let's look for the cosine terms uh, utilizing this general formula here. Uh, so we're going to look at, to find a sub n, we're going to look at 1 over pi times the integral from negative pi to pi of f of x cosine of nx. Okay, but utilizing some of the same tricks that we did before, I'm going to bring that coefficient of pi outside. So there's a coefficient of 1 over pi squared there. We're integrating from negative pi to pi of the square root of x, uh, sorry, the absolute value of x. But again, by symmetry, I can integrate from zero to pi, doubling the whole area. And then the right-hand side of the absolute value of x is just x itself. So then I want to integrate x times cosine of nx. Now, how are we going to find an antiderivative x times cosine of nx? This is something that seems like we do integration by parts, where we're going to take u to equal x, so that du becomes dx. We're going to set dv equal to cosine of nx dx. So then the antiderivative will be 1 over n sine of nx, like so. So putting this together using the integration by parts, we're going to take u times v. That shows up here. So you're going to get x times 1 over n sine of nx. That's this function right here. It'll integrate it. Well, you'll evaluate it from 0 to pi. Then we get the, that's just part of the antiderivative. You still have an integral to calculate. We have to take the integral of v du now for which du is just dx, so you're gonna get one over n times sine of nx. That antiderivative doesn't seem so bad, but before I evaluate it, I do wanna note here that if you plug in zero into x, it's gonna vanish. Of course, plugging in zero into sine also will vanish. Uh, when you plug in pi for x, that's just a pi, but like we saw in the previous video here, if you plug in pi into sine, any multiple of pi when inserted into sine gives you a zero. So it turns out that this whole thing vanishes. This part of the antiderivative is poof, it's gone. Um, and so therefore, taking that out, we just get 2 over pi squared times negative this thing. I mean, because you're subtracting it. So we're going to end up with a negative 2 over n pi squared. I'm going to bring the 1 over n outside of this thing. So we get negative 2 over n pi squared times the integral from 0 to pi of sine of nx dx there. And so then taking an antiderivative of sine of nx dx, the antiderivative is going to be negative 1 over n cosine of nx. Since there's already a negative there, it cancels out making a positive. Um, we get another uh, 1 over n inside of our coefficient, combining with the 1 over n we already have, is going to give us an n squared. So we get 2 over n squared pi squared times cosine of, of nx right here for which when we plug in zero, we're gonna get a one. And when we plug in pi, we're gonna end up with a negative one to the n. We saw this in the previous example as well. So we get negative one to the n minus one, plus this coefficient, two over n squared pi squared. Now, depending on your choice of n, um, this negative one to the n, if n is an even number, it's gonna be, uh, in that case, you're just gonna get a one, one minus one is zero. Uh, so it's going to mostly vanish. Um, but if you plug in an odd number for the power of negative 1, you're going to get negative 1. Negative 1 minus 1 gives you a negative 2, uh, which then multiplies by the 2 to give you negative 4. So when n is an odd number, you're going to get negative 4 over n squared pi squared. And when n is even, you're going to get 0. This was a similar thing we saw when we did the square wave function in the previous video here. 
Um, if we go through this calculation for b sub n here, um, you get 1 over pi squared times the integral from negative pi to pi of the absolute value of x times sine of nx. I'm actually just going to stop right here. Since absolute value of x is an even function, and since sine of nx is an odd function, their product is an odd function, and therefore the integral of an odd function across a symmetric interval is zero. No antiderivatives is necessary. All of these bn's are zero. Half of the an's are zero. Um, the odd ones are not. And so if we put all of this information into play here, we then get the following. Um, the constant term was 1 half. We're then going to subtract 4 over n squared pi squared, but we're only grabbing the odd, the all, the odd uh, multiples there. So I'm going to write this as 2k minus 1 as k ranges from 1 to infinity in this situation here. Um, and then you're going to get cosine of that same odd multiple, 2k minus 1x. And so in expanded form, this will look like 1 half minus 4 over pi squared sine of x minus 4 over 9 pi squared times, three, uh, times sine of 3x minus 4 over 25 pi squared sine of 5x. And if we continue on, um, you're going to get a minus 4 over 49 pi squared sine pi squared times sine of 7x. So notice here that the multiple of x inside the sine is always, um, oh, why did I write sines there? Sorry, these should be cosines. Sorry about that typo. These are cosines. It was correct in the above formula, uh, but when I copied it down, I apparently wrote sine. So it should all be cosines, my mistake. Um, but as you look at the next term here, it'd be negative 4 over 49 pi squared is cosine of 7x. So the multiple of x inside the cosine, it will always be a odd integer. And then the number in the denominator is going to be that number squared. So like the next one, you're going to get 4 over 81 pi squared times cosine of 9x like so. Um, and so you would repeat this over and over and over and over again towards infinity. I'm going to switch over to desmos.com for a second to show you the graph of these things. Um, and if you want to play around with this graph yourself, uh, you can actually find a link to the graph in the, de in the description, the video's description below. So we see here on the graph our sawtooth function from zero from negative pi to pi. It looks like the absolute value function that's been scaled down by a factor of pi. Uh, and that's so that the top of the teeth stops at y equals zero. The bottom, of course, is on the x-axis like so. And so if we turn on the FOIA series approximation, uh, we don't have the whole series. We're starting off with n equals zero right now. Currently, you just see y equals one half. That was the constant term. As we, as we increase these things, uh, when you look at just n equals 1, man, that is a good approximation. Um, it looks like uh, just a cosine that's been modified, but man, one cosine does pretty good. Um, notice on this that in the middle, it does really, really good. The part that it struggles is at these um, non-differentiable uh, cusps, the corners of our sharp sh uh, sawtooth right there, the saw. The, the, the sharp points of the saw there. Um, it comes to a point on the graph, but the cosine function is rounded, so it's a little bit harder to fit that. But hey, what if we increase it to n equals two? Boom, um, it does a lot better approximating the middle part, and it even got better at getting to the points of the teeth there. Uh, so let's look at this a little bit more increase. We're up to n equals three, n equals four, n equals five, and six. So you notice that each time I inc increment this thing, it gets a lot tighter right here, and then it's getting closer and closer to that corner, okay? Um, the gap between them is so small now. So you can see seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, right? For which if I try to zoom out here, if I zoom out to a quite reasonable scale, you can't tell the difference between uh, the the sawtooth function and this Fourier series approximation. This is just a partial sum. This isn't even the whole thing. We're only at n equals 11 right now. Of course, if you zoom in far enough, you can always see the gap because there is that gap there. Yikes. Uh, but of course, as we start to increase this more and more and more and more and more, you can see that it's approaching that corner. And so if you take the limit as n goes to infinity, uh, that will actually, they'll finally meet each other and you'll get a perfect approximation. And so this gives us the Fourier series representation for the saw two function. And we can see that it is actually a quite tight match right there. And so that brings us to the end 
of our lecture about Foyer series. Remember, this was an encore lecture. It was pretty fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you did learn anything about Foyer series or you just like learning about calculus in general, like these videos. Subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this in the future. Um, if you have friends or colleagues who might benefit from these videos, feel free to share them. Um, and of course, if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to post them in the comments below and I'll be glad to answer them as soon as I can.